The day will soon come when the full stature of Christ will be fulfilled. You know what that is? It's when the last person believes in Christ that was appointed to believe. And that will fill out the time of the Gentiles. Jesus came the first time not to judge the world, but that it might be saved. Did you know that the creator of the universe stepped out of eternity into time, took upon himself a human nature in order that he could live as a man without sin so that he could die for your sins? He took the full penalty of God against every sin that you would ever commit. You may say, well, I'm not a sinner. Well, the Bible says about God's law, it says, whosoever keeps the whole law, the law of God, and yet offends in one point is guilty of all of it. Now, can you say you've never broken God's law? Well, God says, if you have, you're guilty of it all, and that's what qualifies you to be a sinner. But Jesus Christ said, I have come to take that upon myself. And when Christ died on the cross, he paid for every sin you would ever commit. Have you ever stopped to analyze that? You didn't exist when Christ hung on the cross, and yet he died for you. How could that be? It's because God knew you before you were born. God knew every sin that you would commit in your whole life. You know what he did? He put that on Jesus Christ. He laid every sin, the guilt of every sin that you'll ever commit in your whole life, he laid that on Jesus Christ. And you know what Christ did? He paid it. The name of my church in Torrance, California is Tetelestai, because that's the Greek word that Jesus screamed out just as he died. You know what it meant in that culture? Paid in full. He had paid in full for every sin. And when God raised him from the dead, you know what that meant? God was saying, amen, you have paid in full. Because if he had failed to pay for one sin that you commit, that one sin would have kept him in the grave forever. The fact that God raised him from the dead is proof positive that he's not holding anything against you. And there's a fully paid pardon for you if you will just receive it. You know, the Lord has appointed elders and deacons in the church to give leadership, to teach the word of God, and to carry out the common business of the local body of Christ. And the Lord exhorts us to give respect to them and to follow their leading. Now, I think of the problems that must have existed in the church in Thessalonica because Paul had only had about two months to found that church, leading people out of raw paganism, teaching them, grounding them in the faith intensively within a two-month period. And yet, before he left, he appointed leadership. He developed elders and deacons, and he left them in charge. And I can imagine that they had some problems because of the elders learning to exercise authority and people learning to take that authority in spiritual matters. But this has application to us today because... The elders and the deacons, the elders are appointed over the, primarily the spiritual matters of the church, the deacons to carrying out the function and the work of the church. They are there and they are directly responsible to the Lord. And so if you don't agree with one of them, well, don't just start a, an undertone of subversion to try to overthrow them but realize that uh, you can commit it to the Lord and the Lord will correct, believe me. And as an elder, I know that in my job of teaching the Word of God, as with all elders, it is a very, very sobering responsibility. James says, don't all of you try to be teachers for you will receive double discipline. 
And I'm very aware of that. It's a great responsibility to teach the Word of God, and it's taught with prayer and study in the Holy Spirit to understand what it says. Because I do not want to be guilty of misleading anyone in the Scripture. I have a healthy respect for what James said, that those who are teachers will receive double discipline if they step out of line or if they teach something wrong. And I think that's something that needs to be thoroughly comprehended by a lot of people who are teaching the Word of God today, particularly on television. I think it would change some messages. But the Lord will see to that. But for you who are being taught, just realize that the Lord exercises direct responsibility over those who are appointed as elders and deacons in the church. And he wants us to respect their authority and to regard them highly in love because of their work and to live in peace with each other. If you don't agree with the leaders in the local church, don't start a gossip campaign to undermine them. If you have a problem, go to them directly. We've had some problems in this church as all churches do. Thank God we've had very little. Most of the chronic gossipers left. Thank God, may they find peace wherever they've gone. <laughs> One of the perils of being a minister is that you frequently are offered up as roast preacher over Sunday lunch. <laughs> but you know what the scripture says is, look, you're to respect them. And if you have a disagreement, don't go spreading it around everybody else, but go to them as you would with anyone else. And so this is part of what it means when it says to appreciate and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. He says, keep on being patient with all men. That's sort of a summary command for this verse. Keep on being patient. Don't give up. Don't get to the point where are saying, we told you about that last week. Shape up, you know. One of the things that we need to do is to begin to look at others in the light of how God looks at us. You know, I'm so thankful that God has been patient with me. If he hadn't have been, I'd have been out of here. I mean, I'd have been up with the Lord already. But think of it. He's that way with all of us. God is patient and long-suffering. And he wants us to be patient and long-suffering with others. Christianity, true Christianity, has certain distinctives that are absolutely unique that cannot be produced by religions. Christianity is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. It's not a religion. Religion is a, a system of merits and works that are trying to earn God's acceptance. Christianity starts with you being accepted, period. And then you go on to grow in Christ. And it's a direct personal relationship with God. And there are certain distinctives in the Christian life if you've learned to walk in the Spirit, to walk moment by moment in dependence upon the Holy Spirit who has come to live in you from the moment you accept Christ. If you learn to depend upon Him, there's a certain kind of conduct that He produces that's unlike any other religion. Now, one of the most interesting things I've heard recently about this, not repaying evil for evil, you know, it's a fact of just human nature that if someone does something to us, we want to get back, we want to get even. My nature, I'm Apache. If you do something to me, if it takes 20 years, I'll get you back. <laughs> now, that's my human nature. And some of my greatest exploits of creativity have been in getting people back. <laughs> now, that's before I knew the Lord. And a few times when I was out of fellowship. <laughs> Well, 
pray with the frequency of a hacking cough. We are to pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? You can't be in a prayer closet all day long on your knees. That's why I say that, hey, we have to learn to pray through the day. I do that. I've developed the practice of praying through the day. I pray for parking places, and I get them. <laughs> a lot of times, all of a sudden, the name of someone I haven't thought of in years will pop into my mind. You know what? I pray for that person. I, I just figure, hey, God put that name in my mind to pray for them. And many times, someone will tell me, you know, I was really going through something. We'll work it out, and it was about the time God dropped their name in my mind. Do that. Learn to do that. And if you have a problem in your job, pray about it. If you're having problems with your housework, pray about it. If you're having problems with your spouse, pray about it. If you're having problems with your children, pray about it. In other words, pray about everything. And when you pray, what do you pray? Well, God doesn't hear you because of some eloquent preparation of prayer. God hears you because you believe him. And I believe believing prayer is, once again, based on founding your prayers on promises of God. That's why combat faith is so important, the concept of combat faith. And so we should learn to talk things over with the Lord all the time. There are special times, yes, when we, when we go in for a special time of prayer like Randolph's wash night. You know, we never learn all there is to learn about prayer, and so it's great to get together with other believers. God says there is a special power when a group of people get together and pray. There is a special power that is released. But we need to learn to pray personally and daily about everything. You know, if when something happens, instead of just griping about it or saying, Lord, why did you let that happen to me? I've been good. Or things like that. Instead of complaining, pray about it. Learn for that to be your first reaction, a knee-jerk reaction to pray. You know, a lot of people come around me, and all of a sudden it's like they, they walked into something they couldn't see, but there's a whirlwind going on around me. I remember two carpenters who worked at our home remodeling our house. They worked there for two years. Both of them Christians. Both of them trusting the Lord. There were several days where they had to take off because the spiritual warfare around my house is so severe. I mean, if you're Christian and, and you're spiritually perceptive, you pick it up right away because those in a place of spiritual responsibility as I'm in, are under great attack all the time. Well, I trust the Lord and just go through the day normally. I'm, I mean, I know it's there, but it doesn't, you know, I've been in this so long, it isn't something I think about. But it's interesting to see some people come to work closely to me, and boom, it's like they get hit with this invisible wall of spiritual combat. And so I have to warn them, <laughs> be careful how close you get to me. So when I say pray, and that's true of all the leaders in the church, all of the pastors who have the responsibilities of spiritual authority, Satan wants to make them fall. So he's always trying to tempt them to make them fall. And so that's why you should always hold us up in prayer. That's why Paul, the great apostle, said pray for us. Because the battle gets tougher, the greater the authority you're given in the Lord. So as you pray with the frequency of a hacking cough, remember, and remember Tim, and remember Randy and their wives, and remember Randolph and Johanna, and remember me, okay? Hack a few for us. <laughs> now I want you to look, there are three statements about what confession is here. It defines homologeo right there in verse 5. On the one hand, it means to acknowledge with God. He says, I acknowledged my sin to who? To you, O Lord. That's the only one you should confess. 
your sins to unless someone has been wronged by you and they know it. If you've wronged someone and they know you've wronged them, then you should go and confess to them. But don't do what so many people do to me. Please. I have people all the time coming to me and saying, Hal, I just want you to know that I've gotten forgiveness for hating you. <laughs> I didn't know they hated me. They could have just gone away. <laughs> then I got a problem. <laughs> or I had such contempt for you and I finally got in victory. Well, if I knew they had contempt for me, it would be right for them to come and say, ask my forgiveness. But I didn't know that, so I didn't need to know it. They just need to get right with God. Don't need to go around telling everybody, especially that. But you're to get right with God. He's the one you've really offended. And so David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. You know, there's no place in the scripture that authorizes confession before a priest. Nowhere. That was a system that was devised by the Roman Catholic Church to keep people under their authority. And that's a very heavy way to keep them under the authority of the church. But there is no authorization from it in the scripture. We're to confess our sins to God. He says, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. You see, Paul was aware when he wrote these letters that he was writing by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he was writing the Word of God. And so he commanded them, read this to all the brethren. You know something? This is why in this church we seek to teach primarily. Once in a while we have topical messages. But primarily we seek to teach verse by verse through the books of the Bible because that's what the Lord commanded. The Lord commanded that you go through each book verse by verse because in doing that, you don't leave Christians in spiritual malnutrition. You need to keep, in doing this, it helps us to bring the whole counsel of God to the church. And so he commanded that. One of the most frequent problems that you'll find around the church, not by everybody, there are always certain people that have what I call the long proboscis. They want to know about everything, not to help, but just to get ammunition to gossip. And, you know, I, this hit me so hard in Toronto. I'd spoken there all week. God had blessed. I mean, there'd just been decisions for Christ everywhere. And God had really blessed. And one of the ladies who worked for that particular church in the bookstore came running up to me as I was walking out to get in the car to go back to my hotel. She said, Hal, Hal, wait a minute. I just have to ask you this question. And I was very tired, but, you know, I, I stopped and I said, yes, what is it? And she said, how many times have you been married? And I told her, I said, well, lady, why do you want to know? I said, you know, the Lord has taught me that most people don't need to know what they're asking unless it is for some spiritual reason. And I said, all you need to know about me is either the Holy Spirit has spoken through me this week or he didn't. If he spoke through me this week, then whatever my past is, he's forgiven. If he didn't, you don't need to listen to me. Go listen to somebody else. And I left her hanging there with her mouth hanging open. <laughs> but you know, they're always busy bodies. And they don't need to know the things they think they need to know. Just so they can gossip. Just for carnal curiosity. And so it says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Praise God. <laughs> and to mind your own business. And to work 
with your hands. But you know, I think it's extremely interesting that as you read the scripture, God places great emphasis upon motives. And it's a point where God warns us never to judge another brother or sister. You know, sometimes God calls upon us maybe to judge someone's behavior or what they did. But God never authorizes us to judge someone else's motives. You know why? How do you know? You don't know. And I'd say the worst attacks against me have been against my motives. It's been fascinating to watch the attack that's been mounted against me, especially since I wrote The Road to Holocaust. I've always been attacked ever since I can remember. And the attacks got much greater when I wrote my first book, The Late Great Planet Earth. There was a whole barrage, not from the, you know, just normal people, but from other ministers. And the first attack was, ah, he's theologically wrong. And uh, secondly, it was the motive, and it's been the Kingdom Now people, such as Gary North, David Chilton, Rush Dooney, they're the ones who have begun to really accuse my motives in writing. And they have said, well, the only reason Hal ever wrote a book is to make money. Well, I'm glad that the Lord is the judge of that. My books have made money, but let me tell you something. When I wrote my first book, I had no idea that books made money. And writing books is a very difficult thing for me. It's something that does not come natural. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't work in me, I don't write a book. You can ask my wife. It takes divine power to get me going. No human being can. Because I don't like to write. But it's interesting that that was an attack they used on Paul. They've used it on people down through history. And it was comforting for me to know that it's nothing new. But don't ever attack someone else's motives. The Lord says that that particularly displeases him. God places a great deal of emphasis, by the way, on a person's motives. Distress and affliction. He said, you know, we're really excited. Didn't take much for his entertainment, did it? We're really living now because we heard that your faith stands. That's what was important to him. And he says in verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. You know, one time I went through the epistles of Paul and just counted up all the incidents in different groups that he said he prayed night and day for. I mean, Paul must have prayed all the time. And he always was praying for those that he had led to Christ and founded and so forth. Now, you know, that tells me too that praying, at least for the most part in Paul's life, was not a matter of getting off alone somewhere and hiding and kneeling down. I mean, I'm sure he did that sometime. But his prayer life, must have been, whenever his mind was not focused on some purpose, he would automatically be walking around praying in his mind and his heart for people. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, when is your prayer time? And I must be embarrassed sometimes because I, sometimes I, I rarely have a specific prayer time. But I find myself praying all during the day when I'm driving, when I'm walking around, and so forth. And it's just, you know, it's, I, unfortunately, I don't tell people that much, but it does go on. I mean, I pray during the day. I pray God will bring things to mind, and I'll pray for them right there. And let me tell you something. I focus in on God very easily, and so can you. you just know that, hey, it's in the attitude of the heart wherever you are. You don't worship God in this place or that place. God's everywhere. He's constantly in tune with your heart. And pray. Don't waste time. Pray when God brings something to your mind. And I found this. 
that when God brings a person to mind, and God will often bring people to mind, they'll clear blue, you haven't thought of them in a long time, pray for that person right there. Because it's the Holy Spirit showing you they need prayer at that time. But we can all learn with great humility from the Apostle Paul. What a prayer life. What a, what a man God developed in this man. Israel, for the first time, since it became reborn miraculously as a state again in 1948, faces the very real threat of the annihilation of its whole population. And it's the first time that they can do nothing about it by themselves before they've been able to defend themselves. Even May 14, 1948, when they proclaimed themselves a state and immediately five Arab armies marched against them, they still had the ability to defend themselves and they knew that if they fought hard, they could do it. But they're in a situation right now where they face the very real threat of most of their population being killed and for once they can't do anything about it by themselves. The reason is Saddam Hussein has, he and his, he and his gold dust twin brother, Daffy Qaddafi, they are sworn to destroy Israel. And Saddam has literally taken the food out of his people's mouths in order to build the mightiest war machine in the Arab world. An army of a million point two men with 550 modern aircraft and with almost 6,000 frontline main battle tanks. This is more than France, Germany, and England have. It's by far the biggest mechanized army in the Middle East right now outside of Israel. And even Israel doesn't have those kind of numbers. They're just better trained. But he has built this. But the most important thing is he has poured enormous energy, both in money and in clandestine efforts, to build a missile fleet that can carry the largest storehouse of chemical and biological weapons in the Middle East. And he has sworn he's going to deliver those on Israel. And he will do it because in the eyes of the Arab world, that is the ultimate religious good that you can do. Of course, he, his motive has become the second Nebuchadnezzar, the first great king of Babylon. He claims to be the one who has taken the mantle of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's going to be Nebuchadnezzar the second. He wants to be the ruler of the whole Arab world. But he knows to do that, he has to strike a blow that will destroy Israel. Every Arab leader knows if you want to be number one in the Arab world, just destroy Israel. And that will make you, your name will go down in glory and history forever in the Arab world. I really believe that Abraham Lincoln's statement is, though it's not out of the Bible, it certainly reflects what the Bible teaches. He says, you never help a man when you do for him what he can and should do for himself. And you know, this, this liberal establishment in our government has certainly gone a long ways to wreck a lot of the very people they claim they're trying to help. That's why we can never balance a budget. Of course, that the avarice and the greed of the congressmen themselves who pass things with our tax dollars to spend our tax dollars in order that they can buy more votes and stay in forever. Let's see, how did we get there? One thing for sure, we ought to hold our congressmen responsible for going to Washington, not to figure out more ways to spend tax dollars and run up more national debt, but the record that we ought to check out is how much did they do to cut the national debt? Because unless we start doing that as individuals and start holding them responsible, very soon we're not going to have a country left. In fact, it may be too late already. And that fits disturbingly 
accurately into prophecy because we're not in the big picture in the prophecy. There will be trials. Such a graphic lesson I've had to learn in the physical realm. You know, I'm just now getting to where I can walk without limping. And it's been 14 months since my knee was operated on. For over eight months, there was no exercise on my right leg. And I went to Dr. Gary Tuthill, and he, you know, I'd done some calisthenics, physical things. He said, look, boy, if you want to walk, you've got to start really putting some exercise on those muscles. They've atrophied. And there is no way that you'll walk unless you really go through some rigorous exercise. And, you know, I started doing it. And, you know, it's exactly the same with our faith. How many of you have your faith virtually atrophied because you haven't been under any stress or at least related that faith to the stress and believe God? You see, faith is like a muscle. It doesn't stay static. You're either growing in your faith or you're retarding in your faith. You don't stay at one point. It's never status quo. And the Bible tells us that God allows trials into our life because that's the exercise that forces faith to grow. Without stress, without trial, your faith will not grow. It's a thin blue line out You there. bet it is. And if even a small percentage of the people stopped becoming law-abiding, we wouldn't have anywhere near enough police. Well, I've seen it happen. You know, it, it, look how quickly it went to the law of the jungle in both the riots we had here in Los Angeles. That's correct. I mean, I saw it firsthand. I'm not at all thinking that it's going to be a picnic because I can just imagine how quickly we could go to the law of the jungle if there are no food, there's no food left on the shelves of the supermarket. If be about two days here where I live. Yeah. We depend on. Well, you depend on trucks. Trucks depend on fuel. Fuel depends on having the electrical power grids working. So, you know, it could it could boomerang very quickly, and then people panic. They're going to rush in and buy everything that's there. And the person in the greatest danger will be the one that's known to have a supply of food. I don't know what's going to happen, but using my computer, I know that if you get a small virus from somewhere, mm -hmm. that computer can p become a multiplying piece of junk. Well, that's right. It can take I mean, the whole thing. start multiplying false information or it'll just break down. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. This word, by the way, in verse 3, unloving, means not just to be without love, but it means to be without natural love. I mean, you know, like the natural love that a, you would expect a parent to have for the child or for a child to have for the parent. Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. It's the idea that there would be a, a real falling away. And as you trace many of the statements that are made here, there are many things in this warning group of, of behavior that are a direct response to the breakdown of the family. Because one of the most important areas where Satan is attacking in the last days is to destroy the family unit. And boy, is he doing it. And it's just amazing how the world's standards have been put upon church, upon Christians. I'll tell you one thing that has become accepted. In fact, I know with my own daughters, it's become very difficult. And that is the idea is given that if a woman doesn't work, she sort of loses contact with the world. If she just stays home and raises children, she's out of step. She's, she's a loser. 
And, you know, the society has gotten to the point where the standard of living has been raised to where the only way they can keep the standard of living they feel they need to achieve is for the woman to work instead of being at home with children. Now, I realize there are some cases where that's a necessity. It absolutely has to be. But I'll tell you, I'm really proud of one of my twin daughters because she was married about two years ago. They moved into the, the most expensive house that they could stretch to buy. And, you know, they were always stretching to pay the house note. Then she got pregnant, had a child. And I'll tell you the thing I'm most proud of her for is they sold the house and bought one far less expensive so she could stay at home with the baby and wouldn't have to work. Now, to me, that is putting spiritual priorities first because the highest calling, if, if you don't want to be a parent, don't have a child, but if you're going to be a parent, then your calling is to be a mother and to be at home, if at all possible. Now, I know that they're extenuating circumstances. And if you can't do that, lower your standard of living. You can't manage it there, move to Oregon, it's cheaper. <laughs> but they are created beings, and God is teaching through us his multifaceted wisdom to them. Now just think about what this means, how he's doing this. One of the best ways he shows his multifaceted wisdom and also the riches, the unfathomable riches of his grace, he shows them. That's something angels didn't understand before God created man and started dealing with us rebellious creatures. Uh, and that is his grace. They understand it because as God deals with you and with me and with all of those that make up the body of Christ, which is the church, and when he takes our screw-ups and works them together for good, it shows his grace and his multifaceted wisdom. And I find great comfort in that. Because, you know, if we believe God, he can work all things together for good, even when we blow it, and we all blow it. And that's one of the unique features of the age in which we live. But you know, there are certain distinctives about these ages that I want you to, to get a hold of. Now before next week, so... Well, the age of conscience ended when man discovered that in his mind he had great powers of rationalization. Man soon discovered that he could make black white and white black and everything some glorious stage of gray. And so he eliminated conscience as an effective way of God revealing man's need for him and so on. Now we still have a conscience today, don't we? And it still works to some degree but it's not effective enough to show us our need for, for Christ. So there's still, a conscience still operates, but it's not the way of relating to God. Sin can only be forgiven by God's substitute sacrifice. Substitutionary atonement is what we call it technically. In other words, the only way that we could ever be forgiven was be by believing in God's provision of the substitute to die in place of our sins. Religious pride, and by the way, that if you look down through history, the deadliest thing in history has been a holier-than-thou attitude. Religious pride. That's probably caused the death of more people than any other cause on earth. Because when you challenge a person who thinks he can work his way to God, and you challenge that his works will never get him to God, a religious pride sets up, and he becomes lethal. Still that way today, by the way. Kim ran into a guy at a museum uh, out in the countryside, one of those big manor estates, and 
This guy initiates the conversation, over 70 years old, he initiates the conversation with Kim, and he's just all enthusiastic, talking about this, talking about that, and says, I'm not particularly a religious man, but you know, I really think about these things. And so Kim's, you know, he just literally drugged him into a conversation about the gospel. And, you know, he volunteered to come and work. That was part of his uh, church commitment and so forth. And when Kim began to talk to him about the grace of God, all of a sudden this jovial, friendly man became a walking nightmare. He became abusive, insulting. And when Kim just offered that she, her husband was an author and he had written a book that she thought would be interesting to him, he said, I'm otherwise engaged, and turned around and walked off. <laughs> you see, there was a man who went to church, did a lot of good works, and really thought that those are going to get him there. And he doesn't have much time to come to the truth. Might pray for that man. Kim was really shaken, not because of the rejection, but because she knew this man had very little time left. He had heart trouble. And yet, you see, there is such animosity when you start, when you get to a person who thinks that they can do something to help God save them, and you start talking about the grace of God, boy, it'll start bringing out the hostility. That's why in certain places you'll find me really hated. There are certain places where I am despised. One of the chief reasons that the Reconstructionists hate me is because I say the law of Moses is not for this time. And I emphasize the Holy Spirit didn't come to help us keep the law. The Holy Spirit came to enable us through the principle of grace to live on a higher plane that they could never live on. And that brings out hatred. You can't believe some of the things that are said about me. And you know what? Praise the Lord. So persecuted they the prophets before me. Do you know that as we have gotten these super powerful telescopes out into space and we've been able to see beyond what we knew before that they're now discovering that there are universes that are greater than all we knew before out there that we never knew existed. As we study the stars, you can navigate by the stars because they're on exact orbits as they go through space. Exact timing, exact paths. What keeps them on those paths? As far as that's concerned, what keeps you from flying off of the face of the earth out into outer space? Gravity, where'd that come from? That's one of the least understood things in nature, gravity. What makes it work? You know, anywhere you go in science, you'll find that you come up against the fact that there are intricacies of design, intricacies of things that repeat, of powers at work that we can study and see how they work, but we don't know certain things why. For instance, in nuclear science, we can get down to the smallest objects and we can't understand why they are bound together. What are the enormous, unbelievable forces that pull the atoms together? Why does the Earth continue in its exact orbit around the Sun? Just last night, Kim has a peacock feather somebody gave her, a friend of hers in Greece gave her. 
And all of a sudden, she started looking at it, holding it up to the light. And she burst into praise to God. And I looked over at her. She's an artist. And she said, no one can do this. She says, look at it. These gorgeous blends of colors. And then you turn them a certain way and they shine another color. And she started praising God for his great creativity. And she held it up and she said, and Lord, they say this just happened. Clearly seen by the eye of reason being understood by what is made. Okay. So God has revealed that he hates evil. God has revealed clearly within us that he exists. God has revealed by the kindergarten, which is the universe, the, the ABCs of learning God is the... Is the universe by the things that are made he has revealed that he must there must be one true creator god who is distinct from his creation god has revealed by the kindergarten which is the universe the the abc's of learning god is the is the universe by the things that are made he has revealed that he must, there must be one true creator God who is distinct from his creation. Okay, all of that, let's for the moment say all of that is a given. We accept that. Well then, how can this pagan who is out in the middle of a savage tribe, how can this pagan be held responsible for not believing in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you why. The Bible says you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. As Jesus said in John chapter 7, if anyone is willing to do his will, he shall know. He shall know. He shall know of me. You see, once any person on this earth, no matter where he or she is, whether he is a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Shintoist, a New Ager, or a pagan, a headhunter, like the Aka Indians that are down in the Amazon, no matter where this person may be, when he comes to God consciousness, if he wants to know that God, if he has a heart response to that God consciousness, God will move heaven and earth to get the message to him. That God promises, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So there is no such thing as a person dying without finding the truth if he really wants to know the God that all men come to know exists within them. It's really fascinating. You know, I was in seminary when the phenomenon of Jim Elliott and the other men that went down to the Alka Indians in the Amazon from Wheaton College, they went as missionaries down there. They went down and they were all killed. Now, I'll never forget the wife of Jim Elliott coming to seminary with the headhunter who had killed her husband and hearing him give his beautiful testimony of how he came to Christ through her going back in there. And she led practically the whole tribe to Christ. And the first one to believe was a young girl 
And when she believed in Jesus Christ, as, as they were talking, she said, you know, as I was growing up, I kept asking the questions, where is the God who created all of these things about me? And I wanted to know him. And God sent someone down to tell him. You know, there have been cases where no missionary ever got there. And when missionaries did get to a, a remote tribe, they found that they had enough of an understanding about God having a son who came and died for their sins and that they had thrown themselves upon the mercy of God, believing that this son paid for their sins. They didn't know his name, but they knew what he did and they had accepted his forgiveness. No one will ever be saved by being ignorant and believing that there's animal sacrifices or their various religions will save them. No, the Bible says that will never save anybody. But they can be saved by coming to this God consciousness, desiring to know God, and God will reveal to that one, even if he has to do it supernaturally, he will reveal to them that there has been a provision for their sins and they can be forgiven only by accepting that. There, there are cases that show that. So what about the heathen? They're lost. But God has a witness to them and if they respond to this inner God consciousness, God will move to bring and if he has no missionaries that can be brought there, then God himself will stand in the gap. But that's only in extreme cases. God sends us out. That's why people go to the mission field, because the moving of the Holy Spirit comes along and he brings them in. There are so many. I, I think of uh, a man that has spoken here on many occasions, the man who formerly was a Hindu guru. How he thought he was a god. And yet God broke through and brought him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, religion is a blinder. We'll see that in our next section. Religion is truly a blinder. It blinds people to the truth. But God is able to break through if in the man's heart he's truly looking for God. Many people use religion simply as, uh, well, the way others would use drugs, escape. But there are some in these religions that are truly looking for God. And if they are, God will reveal the truth to them. As we look at the world today, Every day I'm looking and analyzing what's going on. Things that I remember taking the predicted scenario that would have to come together before Christ would return. I remember looking at this, putting it all together some 39 years ago now. My goodness, I'm getting old. And some 39 years ago, when I became a Christian, started studying this, I found and, and put together this scenario. And I can remember back in the 60s and the 70s when something in current events would happen that would fit in that scenario. I'd get so excited. Maybe something would happen once every six months or once a year. And I'd be excited about that. Now things that fit in that scenario literally happen every week. And it's almost overwhelming. You know, you can almost be lulled to sleep by so much of it happening so fast. And yet, let us not be lulled to sleep. Christ could literally come at any moment. And the scripture says in verse 3, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, there have been, especially recently, there have been a lot of times where you see a lot of homeless people out there, and I don't know why, my natural inclination, because I was around a lot of this before I was a believer, my natural inclination is to doubt whether somebody who's asking for a handout, whether they 
really are for real or not. And so I usually pass them by. But here lately, I've passed people by and I feel a tug in my heart and I would pray about it and I'd say, Lord, is this a true need? And not every time, but many times, God will say, yes, this is a true need. I will spin around and go catch that person and put some money in his hand. And I find that most of the time I do that, the person will say, God bless you. Because they were a brother or a sister. I remember yesterday, there's a guy, he's a gnarly character. He sits at the off-ramp of the Harbor Freeway. As you're going north, he sits at the off-ramp there at Pacific Coast Highway. He's a gnarly character, looks like an old seaman, looks like an old whaler. He always wears one of these black watch, knit watch caps and things like that. Wears a beard. I love him. Every time I go by the, I will nearly push cars out of the way to get over there by him, roll down the window, and hand him some money. And he always says, Jesus bless you, son. <laughs> and if you pass him by and just wave, he'll just wave and say, God bless you. You know, he doesn't care whether you give him something or not. And he's a guy that I asked him one time, I said, you know, uh, what's your plight? Can't you get a job? And he said, well, I've just come to the point where nobody will hire me. Now, that guy, and I'm sure you can think of others, where here's a person in need, but how much more when there's somebody that you know in the church, and you know they're a brother or sister, and all of a sudden they meet with a calamity, and there's plenty of that going on now. And you know about that. And you have the wherewithal to help. How much more should we be willing to pitch in and give a helping hand to that brother and sister? As a matter of fact, in the three or four years that I was really in combat with the so-called dominionist teachers who deny that there's going to be a kingdom when Christ comes back who deny the rapture, they deny virtually everything about prophecy and say the church is going to bring the kingdom of God in itself. I saw such hatred, both in the way they talk and the way they wrote. Boy, you have to seriously question, are they really believers or not? Because their whole lifestyle is one of vicious attack on anyone who doesn't believe the same way they do. Well, it brings real questions. Here's what the Bible teaches, that God stepped out of eternity into time and took upon himself a true human nature so that that human nature became inseparably bonded with his divine nature forever from that moment on. So when we say every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh, that's what we mean. We mean every spirit that will confess that the eternal creator God became bonded with a true human nature so that he is now both God and man and one person forever. Any spirit that can confess that is of God, believe me. And somebody who's not of God will not confess that. Demons hate that. And I want you to notice it says every spirit that confesses that, not every person or every teacher or every prophet. You know why? Hey, I've had the experience, Randolph's had it much more than me. Some of the other pastors I'm sure have had their socks kind of dropped off too with some of the experiences we've had around here. But I know that there is the true phenomena of demon possession. It doesn't happen all the time. A lot of times we diagnose something as that and it's not. But there are cases of it. And I've been present with situations where we were addressing a person and all of a sudden you put a test of truth to that person and another voice starts speaking out of them and starts going berserk. That's when you're speaking to a demon and the spirit of Antichrist and you challenge them with a certain aspect of the truth, and they will absolutely be exposed and begin to go berserk, don't they, Randolph? And it's, been, it's one of the most eerie things you can come in contact with when you come directly into contact with demons through a person. 
yet I've seen it many times. But that's why it says you challenge them with a truth that it's impossible for them to acknowledge. In verse 3 it says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, that is in the sense stated in verse 2, is not from God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. Now, I want to just emphasize something here. Now, this was a general epistle sent to many, many churches in Asia at first, and of course it was addressed to, to all the churches later. But in this, John could address these churches and say, now don't you remember we talked about the Antichrist, the person, the Antichrist, and how he's coming? Remember you all heard this? What does that tell us? It tells us that the apostles considered an essential part of basic teaching to give them prophecy about the end times, including even prophecy detailed about the Antichrist. So we can never, ever let anybody say prophecy is unimportant or prophecy is not practical. It is. And the apostles certainly believed it. So he can refer to these false spirits, these false teachers, as being from the Antichrist. Now in verse 4 he says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The Holy Spirit, who dwells in every believer, is greater in power and authority than the spirits that are in this world. So when you turn on your discernment, and you come into contact with these false spirits, don't be afraid because greater is he who is in you than the one that's in the world. You don't have to be daunted when you come face to face with these spirits. You can say in the name of Jesus, I command you to move back or to leave this person alone or I bind you regarding working this person's life. You have that authority and you have that power but it's always in the name of Jesus. So he says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, in God, literally. Hey, as far as God is concerned, everything that's outside of his work is dead. Although you're sitting here in Torrance, California, in Tetelestai Christian Center, physically, in a very real sense that's just as real as the fact that you can see, you can hear, you can feel the surroundings here. In a very real sense that's even actually more real, you are also at this moment seated at the right hand of Christ. You may say, what kind of mumbo jumbo is that? It's not mumbo jumbo because God says it's true. And you're already seated at the right hand of God. Listen, knowing that and counting it true has taken me through some of the toughest periods in my life because this body has gone through some pretty tough experiences while I've been a Christian on this earth. And yet, I have at the same time known that I was in the presence of Christ, seated at his right hand, because God said so. And to me, what God says is more true than anything else on the face of this earth. Amen. And knowing that I had that position with him saw me through tough, tough situations. Knowing that nothing could separate me from the love of God, especially when I've blown it. I remember I went to a very special social event one time, and I hadn't been there more than 30 minutes before I had spilled some punch all over my white shirt. I couldn't leave, but boy was I embarrassed to be out where people could see me.
so I tried to stay in the shady parts of the room. Wherever in that house where this social event was, I tried to find the shadiest spots. And I tried to stay out of people's view. Why? I didn't want them to see. And you know, that's the way it is, only much more so, when you know by what you understand of God's truth that you have sinned against the Lord as a Christian. You don't want to be exposed. So you start walking away from the light. You walk away. You try to get away from what you understand of God's truth. You don't want God to see. And let me tell you something. As a Christian, you can really become alienated from God's presence because of guilt when you know that you've done something wrong. And it is impossible to walk in fellowship with God if there's a known sin in your life. Believe me, it's impossible. And the most important thing that happens is that when there is a known sin in your life that you haven't confessed, it short circuits the filling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit changes from his normal ministry, which is to guide you, to teach you, to give you power over the old sin nature, and over temptation, to give you power to walk with God, power to serve God. He changes from that to one basic ministry, and that is to convict you of the known sin to bring you to repentance and confession. In God, there's no sin at all. So if there's a known sin in my life, then how can I walk with a holy God? I have to confess what I know to get it out of the way so I can walk with him. But if you know there is an issue between you and God, there is no way that you can be in fellowship with him. You're still in a relationship with him forever, but as far as your fellowship, that's interrupted. Now, in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, this is a Christian. Now, this is to show, hey, there's no room for holier-than-thou people in the Christian life. No room for them. Friend and I were just discussing a well-known, two well-known preachers that have extensive radio and television ministries. And this friend who has a great deal of spiritual perception said, you know something? I love what they teach, but I have a real problem with these two men. And I said, why? He said, well, because they always talk about sin as if it's not their problem, it's everybody else's problem. They talk about sin as if they're already above it. And this guy paid me the highest compliment when he said to me, Hal, the reason I love you is because when you deal with sin, you deal with it as someone who's in the same battle as I am. And you know, that's the way it always should be with all of us. Hey, we all are in the battle. Now, I want you to look. There are three statements about what confession is here. It defines homologeo right there in verse 5. On the one hand, it means to acknowledge with God. He says, I acknowledged my sin to who? To you, O Lord. That's the only one you should confess your sins to unless someone has been wronged by you and they know it. If you've wronged someone and they know you've wronged them, then you should go and confess to them. But don't do what so many people do to me. Please. I have people all the time coming to me and saying, Hal, I just want you to know that I've gotten forgiveness for hating you. <laughs> I didn't know they hated me. They could have just gone away. <laughs> then I got a problem. <laughs> or I had such contempt for you and I finally got victory well if I knew they had contempt for me 
it would be right for them to come and say, ask my forgiveness. But I didn't know that, so I didn't need to know it. They just need to get right with God. Don't need to go around telling everybody, especially that. But you're to get right with God. He's the one you've really offended. And so David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. You know, there is no place in the scripture that authorizes confession before a priest. Nowhere. That was a system that was devised by the Roman Catholic Church to keep people under their authority. And that's a very heavy way to keep them under the authority of the church. But there is no authorization from it in the scripture. We're to confess our sins to God. Chapter 2, verse 9, the one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother is in darkness. He's in, he exists in darkness. Secondly, the one who hates his brother or sister, by the way, these are generic terms, is walking in darkness. In other words, he's living in darkness. And also, the one who continues to hate is going away in darkness, is blinded. So it's a very serious thing. You know, as I was studying this this morning, I realized there, there are a few people in my past who really did me some harm. And I have carefully nurtured a dislike for them. <laughs> so when I read this, I said, uh-oh, I'm going to have to straighten this out. And, you know, these two situations go back over 20 years. And it isn't that I've outright hated them. I just absolutely don't want anything to do with them and <laughs> don't like them. So I got to straighten this out. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll do that. How about you? There is, in the realm of the Christian faith, there's just no room for nursing a hatred of somebody, no matter what they've done. And the only way you can deal with that is you look at how great of the sins God's forgiven you. And it says that as Christ has forgiven you, so forgive one another. And the only way you can do that is to look at how Christ forgave you. And then, then you're more disposed to forgive. <laughs> but it's very important. It's not a side thing. Because any hate that's allowed to fester in the heart will drive you into darkness. It will drive you away from the light of the truth of God. And as Pastor Randolph was saying, I was interested in what you said in your opening comments about he wants to leave a legacy of the most caring church. And what a legacy that is to leave. I would like that too. Because if you are a loving church, then there's not going to be any cause for stumbling in you. You may foul up here and there, but God's not going to be that concerned about it if you're a loving church. And we are to cultivate a love for one another. Not to come here in hermetically sealed isolation, sit here and listen to a message, and then be very careful you don't talk to anybody and leave. Okay? That is not what God had in mind. So I don't mean to get a Pollyanna smile and, you know, sort of fake it and say, I love you. No, don't, don't mean that. But just to start looking at one another in the light of the fact that we're going to spend eternity together. Each one of us is one for whom Christ died. And to begin to fully appreciate one another, to know something. That's why the home churches are so important, because there you begin to learn some of the needs and heartaches and distresses that people are going through. You can't care for somebody if you don't know what they're doing. So you need to learn about each other. And as you're exposed to one another, you find that there is a love and a care the Holy Spirit will give you. And that is what Christianity is really all about, or should be.